Hey, this is Eric from Catching Light. Hey, this is Hemp. Hey, this is Glenn. Hi, I'm Steve O. Hey, this is Drew Hines with Hindsight Imagery. This is Matt Callahan and Digimati Photographic Services. Hey, this is Jason, and welcome to Tales from the Pit. Welcome to Tales from the Pit, the behind the lens access for concerts and photography. Today we have a very special guest. You know him as a guitar player for Alice Cooper. He's been a guitar player for many, many bands and hopefully we'll learn about him today. Mr. Ryan Roxy, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Jason. Hello, Eric, aka Hemp. How you doing, man? (laughs) We're doing great, thanks. We're so, talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us sort of a sort of a brief history of how you got to where you are? Maybe some background. Brief of- history of, of before yeah, sure. uh, we started this podcast and before yeah, we started sure. the show. Because what was happening right minutes before was quite entertaining <laughs> as well. But if you want the entire history of, of myself um, in one or two sentences, huh? Well, I've been in the trenches uh, of rock and roll for most of my life. Um, I have played in a lot of bands, like you said in the very top. I probably played about 100 bands, but 98 of them you haven't heard of. So I've been working all those years trying to get to the point of where I am today. And I still don't feel I've reached that point of where I want to be. And that's a good thing, I think. I think you always have to stay inspired, always have to stay driven. But um, my biggest... Uh, sort of break that I've had in my career and I've been able to sort of milk it and ride the coattails, whatever you want to say, but it's been my association with Alice Cooper because that has opened so many doors for me throughout my career, uh, you know, along with playing with a guy named Slash and playing in his solo band, his record Ain't Life Grand and being able to co-write with those guys and that band, as well as other artists like Gilby Clark from Guns N' Roses, who I knew even before Alice Cooper, and um, maybe some others that you might know. You might know the song She's So High by the artist Tal Bachman. Yep. Um, made I a love big that song. Made it well, made a big splash with a with a exercise bike attitude in this cancel culture we live in. Uh, they wanted to cancel all exercise bikes last year because of this ad of this woman, you know, this very fit woman, like getting an exercise bike for Christmas or whatever. But for like about two weeks or three weeks, uh, that song was played nonstop. And that's my guitar playing. And I, I've got the solo in that song as well. So um, nice. I've had some really cool experiences with music. I've been able to see the world playing music. I'm very happy about that. And it was one of the things that when I was a little kid, that's what I said I wanted to do. I wanted, I wanted to be all those posters on my wall that I think all of our generation had, you know, whether it was Rush, Kiss, Cheap Trick, Aerosmith. Um, I even had posters of like uh, David Cassidy on my uh, on my wall, and it and so that leads to this whole thing of like, who am I trying to be? Am I trying to be Keith Richards or am I trying to be Keith Partridge? And I think I'm maybe an amalgamation of both through all the bands that I've been to, because I I love guitar, I love rock and roll guitar, but I also like pop music and I was raised on pop music. I was, I, I was that prime example of the kid in the seventies that was, you know, exposed to so much disco music that you couldn't hate disco. You could say disco sucks cause it was cool. Cause kiss said disco sucks or, you know, uh, but at the same time it was infectious. And so I grew up listening to, you know, Aerosmith next to earth, wind and fire next to Cheap Trick, next to ABBA. So that's, that's, that's about, and that's kind of like the spectrum of bands I've been in. The other 98 that you might not have heard of. <laughs> that's a good mix of stuff. I mean, when, you, when you're diverse like that, it really broadens your playing style and options and all that stuff too. So that's really good diverse stuff. I think with, with everything in life, if you can kind of sample, take a little sampling of everything and then 
kind of focus in with what works best for you and your set of tools and you know what's in your wheelhouse and a lot of my best sort of traits I felt at that time was the performance aspect of it. I, I was a ham up on stage. I might have been a little bit shy off stage. Um, that's changed now because I'm pretty much verbose everywhere <laughs> all the time. But, uh, and, but that has to do a little bit with, with just doing it and, and, and gaining that confidence over the years. But starting out, I was very much uh, wanted to be the, the performer because the guitar players that I looked up to were showmen whether it was yeah. Angus Young or whether it was Ace Fraley or whether it was, you know, one of my biggest heroes is Rick Nielsen from yeah. Cheap Trick and just ultimate showmen and ultimate rock stars like a guy like Brian May, you know, yeah. bigger than life, those, those characters that are bigger than life. And I, I think, you know, as you can see from, <laughs> from Eric's background, that is exactly the stage I wanted to be on growing up and, it's just so surreal, but actually, you know, perfect for me in my, my head that I'm playing, that's our stage, you know, and when I came in, when I late folks, like I was a little bit late and, and I know I'm not supposed to be late. I know it's a cliche for, oh yeah, musician, rock and roller, he's going to be late. No, I'm usually not. And I've learned that from Alice Cooper. Five minutes early is five minutes late. He, and that's one of the best traits to have as a professional musician and you want to be a working musician is, is be on time, be prompt because it's other people's time as well. Sure. And so when I came in late, I was embarrassed, but then I saw, I saw my stage in the background. I said, Hey, wait a second. Am I late to my own concert? <laughs> there <it> was. <laughs> yeah. So that was actually taken at our venue, uh, Bank of New Hampshire, 2019. I, you know, uh, ironically, I think you guys were supposed to be there this month. Yeah, uh, yeah, as well, probably. like probably. real soon, unfortunately. Wow. Uh, we'll we'll, we'll catch you on the next one. Was, was that was one of the shows that was going to be there with Lita Ford and Tesla or something yep. like that? Or was yes. going to be? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know what? Look, the hope is that all those, you know, my trigger word these days is postponed. All those postponed gigs do actually get made up and yep. we can come out there and do it. But um, at the same time, I'm not sitting around, you know, gloom, doom, sitting in, you know, my, in a dark room, although I am in a dark room right now. Um, but, it's, it, but it's a room of creativity now because I've turned all that sort of, you know, time that I would normally be out on the road into doing creative stuff. And part of it is, uh, a big part of it is doing the podcast that I do now, as well yeah. as coming up with this guitar lesson series that I have and keeping in touch with all the musicians that I've met over the years and seeing like, Hey, while we have this time, maybe, maybe it's an opportunity to write some stuff together. There's going to be a lot of good music oh, cool. coming yeah. out. I think in the well, next six months, yeah. I think there was a little bit of shell shock to begin with, but then I think now the creative juices are starting to flow because it's one of those things you can't just because you have the time you can't just all of a sudden be creative i, I don't believe in you know I, I whatever you know the rock gods or however whatever you want to believe comes a, a good riff or a good song comes to you um i don't think you can plan that and even though we have the time now maybe it's it's it wasn't, it wasn't planned for those riffs to come. But now, slowly for me, and I'm finding out for a lot of my friends, it's that, hey, I'm starting to, I'm starting to gather some creative um, energy. And, yeah, uh, and I, I, from what I'm seeing from the you know, fan perspective, I'm seeing a lot of different type of creativity as well, whether it be people rebuilding original uh, uh, cover songs or just sort of stepping outside of the box of their normal comfort of writing. So I'm seeing a lot right. of you know, change in the writing styles as well, too. We're going to have to start thinking out of the box. We're going to have to start thinking of a different type of performance, I think, at least for the immediate future. And who knows how long? Because, okay, if it's this thing this year, okay, what's, you know, the great locust attack of 2022 or whatever, you know, if we're going by all the whole apocalyptic way of thinking. I mean, how are we going to turn a virtual experience into a real meaningful um, 
personal experience. And right. I think that's what a lot of us are doing. So, or, yeah. or just trying to figure it out right now. But at the end of the day, a good song is a good song. And um, the, when you hear those good songs coming out, you know, with, you know, when you hear a good song, the one that just makes you do that thing. Instead, yep. Of, yep. instead of going up and down, it makes you sway side to side. Those are the songs <laughs> where I feel, okay, that's a good song. Now, are you working on any solo stuff or? Um, I put out a solo album um, a while back, but I did something, Eric, that I think actually a lot of people are going to start doing and, and following. I, I obviously had planned it in my head. Like I wanted to get the most longevity album out of an album. And I felt that for so many years of a band, a solo artist put out an album, they literally had one month met tops to really uh, have light shine down on it. You had to put your first single out. And if it wasn't, if it didn't take off right away, you had to put your second single out real quick in hopes that you gained uh, some sort of traction and then you went on tour. And my idea from the beginning was like, you know what, we put too much time and effort into creating the songs and I don't want to have any throwaway songs. So I'm going to put 10 songs that I think are pretty decent on an album and re give each one of them a single release. So, so you know, I started releasing sync songs from this album back in 2018. And I would just release one, have a nice like sort of um, moment for it and really hype it up. And then I get ready to do the next one. So 10 songs, 10 videos uh, and 10 single releases. And I'm up to number nine now. So there's one that's, more that's before awesome. it actually closes cool. out. But that's not to say that we haven't been doing some writing some other ideas. I'm, I feel that um, our guitarist, Tommy Hendrickson, is such a great producer. Um, he's done, obviously, Hollywood vampire stuff. He's done a lot of his own stuff. And he's mixed um, a lot of the tracks off my last solo album. So I feel he's so creative in that field. And he writes great songs. And we we uh, work well together that if he has an idea or if I have an idea, we can bounce it off each other and hopefully something good comes of it, you know, within the band structure. Yeah. So that uh, listening to your recent, one of your recent podcasts, and we'll talk about your podcast in just a moment as well uh, with Kane sure. Roberts and talking about, Oh, yeah. giving each individual song its moment as you just spoke, maybe creating a video for it as well. You know, and to be honest with you, from a fan experience, if I'm, if I'm a fan, well, I'll, I'll just say maybe the average younger fan today doesn't fully, you know, listen to an album. They listen to specific songs Excellent. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you're putting out a, a, your, your spotlight on these individual songs, you're actually giving the opportunity for me to more likely purchase a song as well as, as opposed to purchasing an album. It's really getting, you know, more of that perspective from a fan perspective, I think, as well. That's how I put it out. I released it on vinyl and on CD, old oh, cool. school yeah. versions that, no, yeah. that nobody, you know, a very small percentage anymore on, on the grand total and the grand spectrum of people actually purchase music anymore. But I knew that my hardcore fans would appreciate a really good vinyl version and a really good packaged CD version. So we had all of those done as you should sit down with an album, put a pair of headphones on, like, you know, preferably 70s, big old pioneer headphones or whatever, and uh, listen to the album track one to the end track. And uh, but while I put these singles out, I, I made them available song by song. So basically you, you could go into iTunes and whatever single I was up to at one point, those were the only songs you could hear. You couldn't hear the entire album. Right. So it, it really helped uh, give each song a little bit of a spotlight, like you were saying, and give it a little bit of a special moment. And so now there's still, yeah, there's still one song on the album that you can't find digitally and you have to buy the old school tangible versions, which is something cool. that is actually quite cool because my I have a 15-year-old daughter who, what did she want for Christmas? A vinyl player. And she actually <laughs> went, you know, the only difference is that she ended up buying her vinyl at Urban Outfitters instead of Tower Records. <laughs> so, yep. so go figure. That's what my son asked for last Christmas. He wanted a something to play records on he's got he found a yard sale and he's got all the old ones even the alice cooper all on vinyl and that's all he's listening to now he loves it yep. nicely done it's, 
It's very, that's a very interesting thing. Coincidentally, my 18 year old daughter just asked for the same exact thing. So there's obviously <laughs> a trend there. So you're definitely on to the right, on the right path with all that stuff. Absolutely. So oh. can you go back and tell us about, um, how did you get your first guitar? How did you, how did that happen? Or was guitar your first instrument? Santa Claus, you know, uh, was yeah. Santa Claus. It was, <laughs> and, but, but the cool thing about Santa Claus uh, was that uh, they knew <laughs> that I, um, I actually received a real quality guitar. I, the, the first guitar I was ever, electric guitar I ever had was a Fender Stratocaster, Jimi Hendrix, sort of off-white, uh, oh. uh, you know, sort of Monterey pop festival guitar, the one he lit on fire. It obviously wasn't that one, but it was a, a really cool cream version of this Stratocaster um, post-CBS. Everyone always says pre-CBS, but I, I, it sounded great to me. It played, and I knew I could play stuff off it like right away, because it was a good tool. You know, I, I, I always say whatever guitar that anyone is going to get to start their guitar journey, just make sure it's the guitar that makes you want to sit down and play just a little bit more. If it makes you want to sit down just for a couple more minutes, it's going to really um, further you with your own journey. So I, luckily, I got the right tool. I got, I, got, I got a Fender Strat, but then years later, I found out all my bands that I was listening to weren't playing with these single coil pickups and, and right. thinner sounding guitar sounds that the Strat sort of offered, um, unless you're Jimi Hendrix or unless you're Steve Ray Vaughan and can make a Strat sound like a Mack truck. But these, all the other guitar players that were looking at it had humbucker pickups, had these double pickups in it, which means, okay, that's, that's what I need to get now. So idiotic me in high school or early high school, somewhere around there, I traded my Strat for an Ibanez. Not that Ibanez is bad, but at that time, was trading a Stratocaster for an Ibanez uh, ex Destroyer. It was a Gibson Explorer, sort of their yep. version of a copy. And uh, that was, didn't make any sense except for the guy who I traded it to. <laughs> and he was like happy as shit. And nowadays, yep. if I looked at it, well, you know what? I'm still on that elusive hunt for my first uh, Stratocaster. And luckily this last year I had, uh, I had a, a company uh, named Palermo. They sort of replicated it for me as close to what I w oh, nice. imagined it being as possible. Yeah. That's so, pretty nice. Yeah, that started off with that, started off with that guitar and, and started off playing local talent shows at, uh, uh, I lived up in Northern California. So they had this thing called the Alameda County fair. And I was in a band called, uh, get this we came up with our name at the audition because we didn't know it was three guitar players and no drums no bass maybe we were ahead of our time in that sense too white stripes or was it like yeah. sort of a hybrid of white stripes only guitar and uh the judges said well we need a name for you before you guys go on for the actual competition and none of us could come up with a name so everyone looked at my guitar neck and they said we're the stratocasters so uh, Stratocasters <laughs> won first place playing, uh, I think it was Your Mama Don't Dance, Your Daddy Don't Rock and Roll, not Poison's version, uh, you know, obviously, Loggins yeah. and Messina's version, yeah, of course. Yeah. And um, also Jumpin' Jack Flash, uh, not oh. Peter Frampton's version, but uh, Rolling Stones, which nice. they both do great versions of. I'm, I'm not disparaging Poison or uh, right. Peter Frampton. Love them both. Right, right. But the original, the original is that founding piece of music. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So do you remember maybe your first record, first cassette or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, totally. Uh, my first, well, the first record that you consider a rock and roll record or do you, or is you just saying first record? Because, because I got, I was, like I said, born and raised on pop music first. It was like yeah. the Partridge family, the Osmond brothers. I remember yep. this albums. I remember Bobby Sherman records. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the first real rock and roll record I got was um, a Clarence Clearwater revival record that my grandma bought me. You know, that, yeah, that was kind of like it was gritty and it was rock and roll. Yep. And, then, and then everything changed pretty much when love gun came into my world because <laughs> yeah. it was it, it really was 1977 and so many important albums came out that year because it wasn't just love gun that that, that kiss released <clears throat> it was cheap tricks first album came out 
uh, Sex Pistols first album came out. Um, I mean, Hotel California, the Eagles had come out right, right around that, that whole time. And one of the biggest albums for me at that time was Queen News of the World. And just yep. that, that face of that sort of, you know, Amatron, am a, uh, you know, computerized. What is he? What is the Queen News of the World creature? Is he is he, is he a machine? Is he just a right. avatar? Well, he he was early on being an avatar, I thought, but he was he was amazing. And that album to me, pound for pound, one of the best albums ever made, News of the World, because it has such a spectrum of music on it. Yeah, all those are. I mean, those are all. I that's it's such an iconic moment in the history of rock and roll. That all those all those albums. Definitely. Well, that, everyone that I just mentioned, literally right around that time of 1977. So yep. people ask me, what's the Roxy 77 for? Well, hey, hey. There's oh, there we go. Clue. There's nice. a little clue. Okay, cool. Nice. <laughs> so what, well, actually, I, I'll let Hemp ask. Hemp, why don't you go ahead and ask the question? Um, well, number one, why are you in Switzerland? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not in Switzerland, but you know what? That's that's and that's the that is the common mistake that pretty much uh, every American, including myself, uh, makes even to this day. And it gets even more confusing. I'm in Sweden, which is basically the North Pole. So I'm I'm in Stockholm, Sweden. But uh, Tommy, who I was talking about earlier, who also plays with me, and Alice Cooper, he lives in Switzerland. So whenever we meet people. You know, it's it's really it's it's uncanny how it is a fifty fifty thing, but they'll always think that I'm the one from Switzerland and Tommy's the one from Sweden. But no, and and they also and and people uh, usually think that Switzerland and Sweden are pretty close, which they're not. It's like it's a two hour, two and a half hour flight. It'd be like if like oh, you know, I'm from California. Well, I'm from Texas. Oh, well, you guys must know each other. Well, no, we're, we're, we're kind of far apart. So uh, the thing is, I, you know, I do know a lot of people now in Switzerland and from doing the podcast and from obviously visiting Tommy and stuff. Um, it's getting closer. Living in Europe for this many years as I have. I've been here for almost 15 years now on and off. Wow. Um, but it's, it is a much closer community because it is, you know, an hour and you're in a different speaking a country, a language, you know, he's like, or just even a, a, you know, train ride from, you know, France to, to London, you're just totally different cultures, like in a very short amount of distance. So why was I here? I was living in Los Angeles. I always wanted to live in Europe my whole entire life. I was married to, at the time, a Swede, and it, Sweden just seemed like, a, let's, let's try it. We know what the States is like right now. And this was like 2005. We know what's going on in the States. Why don't we try Europe for a while and we can always come back. And, uh, well, we had two children and um, in Sweden, we split up, but our kids are here. And so I'm not going to go anywhere until, you know, at least they're set, you know, through high school and we can uh, make a plan for the next because, even though me and their mother have divorced many years ago, I got remarried a couple of years ago to a South African. So now the next plan is, well, maybe South Africa will be a nice place to go down and check out and live. So I'm, cool. I'm not closing any, I'm not closing out any country right now, living, but right now the, the main focus is being here in Sweden for the kids. And then in Kashila's up here now makes zero sense that a South African and a guy from California would be living in Sweden. But for us, it makes sense. It's all How are you guys family. handling the uh, COVID? Uh, totally different than any other country, as you've probably read in the yeah. news. It's a, it's a different type of way of dealing with things. Um, I think the government here feels that at the end of all of this, the numbers will all sort of average out between other countries and, and, and our country. Um, I think... What works here is that the population is much lower than and less concentrated than any places, any place in the states, really. I mean, except for when you get those vast, vast, vast Midwestern states. But if you think about it, and to put things in perspective, there's about nine and a half million people total in the country of Sweden where there's nine and a half million people in Los Angeles alone. I think there's yeah. 11 million in Los Angeles. Yeah. So, so if you think of, of, of the cities that, that have these 
populations that are close to nine, 10 million people. Think about that being in, in, concentrated in one city. This is spread out over a very large country of Sweden. So this, the way that they're dealing with it, I feel might not work the same in the States. It couldn't work in the States, but yeah, it's, 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 sort of, it's sort of working right now in the sense that people, you know, here in Sweden kind of are, are a little bit, especially when it gets to these colder months, which we have a lot of them, it is getting from point A to point B with as little interaction with other people as possible. So I think social distancing probably was a little bit more popular before, you know, we had a head start on it, you know, for many years here, just because of being so frigging cold and dark that you don't spend a lot of time, you know, chit-chatting and, and not as sociable a place as you would say in, in a warmer climate or definitely just, just the overall attitude in, in, uh, in Los Angeles or California, where I grew up or anywhere in the States, it's such a homey vibe. Like, how are you doing today? What's up? You know, here in Sweden, it's like, how are you doing? Are you suffering from hypothermia? Are you okay? Are you going to survive? Okay, now I'm off. <laughs> nice. But honestly, once you get to know Swedes, they open up and very, very, uh, very sincere, very stand up, very proud. And, um, very cool. I mean, like I said, I've, I've been very lucky to have make a lot of great friends here in Sweden, have some different types of um, mu music band, uh, music projects, so many different types of styles. And uh, the bands that I've all played in, the musicianship has been really, really high. Uh, cool. the, the, they're really, really good musicians out here. I give, always give them credit. I say you guys always play better than I do. <laughs> As a photographer, that's one on my bucket list, Sweden, Switzerland, to get out there and photograph. Um, oh, come out here. Yeah, I mean, come out here during the summertime when, when all these yeah. festivals are going on. Once all this stuff does pass, all things must pass. And isn't that a, uh, a, you know, George Harrison things, all things yep. will pass? Yep. And uh, they will. But uh, when you have a chance, come on out and, and see some of this. Uh, because oh, yeah. I, I do say there are two types of Swedes. There's the winter Swede and there's the summer Swede. And as people as well. Just on the environment's totally different because you know that in, it's pretty dark. It can get dark up here in Stockholm at the height of its, dark, of its uh, the sun going down, like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's pitch black oh, wow. in the wintertime. But then it's the converse of that exact opposite in the summertime. So now it's, you know, I have to put, you know, blinder shades on in the rooms just so we can do this podcast. Summer it is. And it's late. It's late for us. <laughs> so, Hemp, you want to go ahead and ask another question? Yeah. Um, when you finally do get back on the road, um, and I ask a lot of people this, do you have a bucket list venue you'd like to play at or you love to play at? Wow. I've been very lucky to be able to play a lot of the bucket list places. Hold on just one second. My wife is saying something right now. I'm just doing sure. a podcast right now. So, Okay. Hello. How you doing? I mentioned you in South Africa and the whole bit. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so anyhow, um, bucket list venues. I was lucky enough to cover many of them when we did the uh, 2015, 2016 Motley Crue, final Motley Crue tour, where Alice Cooper was the special guest for that whole entire tour. Oh, wow. That's a good so one. All, every, every town that had a basketball team, we got to play that arena. So that was a huge <laughs> bucket list for me. And the, one of the biggest ones being Madison Square Garden for me. Oh, wow. It was, a, it was a really cool venue. Um, on that same tour, we also got to play the Hollywood Bowl, which is, uh, had always been something that uh, I've you know, of course, when you see the Beatles play it, you go, well, any place that the Beatles can play, can we do that? Um, the ones that have sort of just, like I've just missed is I've not played the Los Angeles Forum. And I would love to play it because for some reason, the years that Alice uh, built up to doing these larger, larger uh, arenas again, we... Uh, they weren't doing shows there. Then they opened up shows at the LA Forum and then uh -huh. it just didn't happen with the routing. So unfortunately, the LA Forum is still of a bucket list place to get on. But you know what? It's, uh, I'm, I'm not losing hope. And uh, Staples Center, that would be kind of good. 
any town that I've lived in and I've seen the, you know, and drive, drove by the arena or am I in Sweden, there's like a place called Stockholm Stadion and I used to live right by it. Um, I still live pretty close, walk, walk by it every single day. And it's, it's the old Olympic stadium and, oh, cool. I, and very few bands get to play there. But I said, you know what, one day I'm going to play that place. It was early on when I moved to Sweden. Uh, as, as fate would have it, I was friends with Eric Singer from playing with Alice Cooper. And Eric Singer played in, in this band called Kiss. <laughs> so instead of asking for free tickets, I asked for uh, an opening slot. And he went to Doc McGee, stand-up guy, Eric Singer, went up to, to Doc McGee and said, hey, my buddy Ryan has a band out in Sweden. They'd like to open up. What do you think? Doc said, let me hear it. Let me see it. Yeah, sounds great. Gave it the green light. And then, you know, we got, we got to do our 35-minute set in front of about 33,000 people. And then I was happy. And every time I walked by that uh, stadium, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty psyched, you know. That's cool. So yes. can we go back to your band for a little bit? So are you vocalist and guitarist for the band? Yes. For, for my solo stuff, um, I play guitar, uh, sing, and, and primarily, you know, write most of the material and stuff. Right. I've had two different lineups, two separate lineups over the years with um, my solo stuff. If, if you want to call it solo stuff, this last album is actually the first solo album I've called Ryan Roxy. Before that, I put out albums under the name Roxy 77. I put albums under the name Dad's Porno Mag. It's because we wanted a band name and just Dad's Porno Mag. It's why not? It, <laughs> it's simpler times, right? This, it was in the, it was in the mid nineties. I think, you know, a lot of the stuff I did in the mid nineties, there's no way you get away with now in 2020. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Can we go back to way back to your first audition with Alice Cooper? How did that, how did that go? What was that about? Sure. Um, that was at a very famous uh, rehearsal studio in Los Angeles called Mates Rehearsal. Pretty much every band uh, that has broken out of there and rehearsed at their preparing for tours, you know, Guns N' Roses, Foo Fighters, uh, you name it, they've played there. And, uh, the auditions were there at the Studio B. And I remember, you know, like it was yesterday, Alice Cooper was there. That For me, that was a big deal. That the guy was there to see who was going to be in his band. Bob Daisley, very uh, world-renowned bass player, uh, was playing bass. And Eric Singer, there it is, Eric Singer again, was playing the drums. Yep. And um, we played, I walked in, and but, but before I walked in, I actually pull the total audible because I was in the uh, office right next door to where they were having the rehearsals and, and the auditions. And I heard all these shredder guitar players coming down, you know, it was like Warren Demartini from rat. And there was, uh, oh, wow. uh, there was some guys from dream theater. There was red beach from winger and they, they, they were completely nailing the shredding stuff, the 80s stuff. But when I was listening to it, I was, I, the one song that they were having, every single one of them had a little bit of a hiccup was that pre-chorus of the song Poison. And mm -hmm. it's a tricky one. It was, you know, it's, it's one of those Desmond Child songs. And if you know Desmond Child, he wrote all those Bon Jovi hits with yep. all these different modulations. And so he, this pre-chorus in Poison is really tricky. And these guys were stumbling over the chords of it. And if you stumble over it, it's hard to get back on track. So at that moment, in the sort of coffee lounge, I say, you know what? Don't play any of the shredding stuff. You've learned it, but you know what? These guys are much better at it than you are. And Alice needs two guitar players, not one. He right. needs that one 70s guy. He needs that one guy that's going to just hold on to a note. And he needs that guy that's going to nail those chords and poison every single time. And you can do that. You can be that guy. And so I went in there and completely just played the chords on that song. And then when it was my turn to solo, I just laid out a really legato, long note solo. And, um, you know, the rock gods I talked about earlier, they shined down on me that day and uh, things, things went well. And it, it was 96. And that was a one year tour that turned into a relationship with, uh, with one of rock and roll's biggest icons that to this day i i'm proud to call him my boss and i'm proud to call him my friend you know yeah that is it's such a great 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 achievement i mean alice cooper and 
the amount of talent and you know all the stories we hear from him about him and his crew and everything like that it's just, i mean you obviously know it way more than anybody else but the, the it's a legend you know on both the touring side and the stories and the music and well, everything he, yeah he he gives credit he gives a lot and shines a lot of spotlight on his bands and on his band members you know he talks highly of his former bands and his band members which always give us such credibility trust me yeah. right? like when i say ride the coattails and opening doors he has, you know, he, he wrote the forward in my uh, box set that I put out a couple of years ago. And, and to this day, I quote it because it, he just wrote it so, so well. And he does have good stories. And, but, you know, here's the thing. Alice does like to embellish. And I've learned a little bit of that, I think, from doing the podcast and sort of, you know, telling these stories. And sometimes, you know, it starts out as one thing, you know, it starts out, well, you know, I had a potato and a pocket knife. And, you know, at the end of the story, it's a machete and a human skull. <laughs> but, you know, these things are like, <laughs> these, the, he says this, never let the truth get in the way of a good story, which I kind of understand now. At first, I was like, no, that's a lie. It didn't happen that way. But now I'm like, yeah, never let the truth get in the way of a good story, Roxy. <laughs> Right. It's all part of the entertainment value of whatever you're delivering, sure. <laughs> Unless you're president of the United States. Then, well, yeah, then we then get a whole different thing. it doesn't help out so much letting the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> so on your, on, Someone took on it your, a bit too far. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. On your audition day, did you know by the end of the day that you were in the band or did it take some time? I had a good feeling. I had a good feeling when I walked out of that rehearsal room because Alice, like, yeah, he looked at me and, and he looked at, I think he looked up at uh, Eric Singer and he goes, you never know, you never know. <laughs> and so that goes like, okay, you never know. Uh, you didn't think I was going to come in and, and because I, I kind of was looking the part more than I think, you know, he expected me to play the part. I looked like one of those seventies guys at that point. I think I, had, yep. you know, came in maybe with, I don't even know. It was sunny out, so maybe I kept my sunglasses on. I don't know what the hell I was doing. But, you know, maybe I came in with a little bit of a haircut and an attitude, but I backed it up with, you know, the right chords and yeah. the right notes. I mean, that, that's the thing I tell up-and-coming musicians. I go, I don't care how much of an attitude you have. You can have as much attitude you want as on stage. In fact, the more attitude you have, the more people are going to react to you. But don't start having an attitude with your band members that are support you. Don't start having an attitude when you're off stage and you, know, you treat your fans good. Alice right. has taught me that as well. You treat your fans because they're the ones that got you there. Yeah. You know, people always ask Alice, they go, oh man, don't you ever get sick of, you know, isn't it a problem if we take a picture with you? And he goes, no, it's a problem if you don't. <laughs> It's a problem if we don't take a picture with each other. It's no problem to take a picture. It keeps us, you know, keeps us working. Yeah, so, totally. you know, the attitude thing I, I, I say is important, but you have to back it up with your confidence and talent. And don't let confidence turn into arrogance. Confidence is great. Arrogance is kind of like, eh, whatever. Yeah. So when you're on the road, what is your day like on tour? Oh man, this is gonna make a lot of this is gonna make a lot of middle-aged guys very jealous <laughs> because uh, it's the ultimate sort of kid, big kid sort of lifestyle. Um, I'll wake up at about seven o'clock in the morning on the bus, usually maybe even earlier, sometimes six thirty, depending on when the golf course uh, actually opens. Alice likes to be the first one out, so again, that whole five minutes five five minutes early is five minutes late. You got to be in the car ready to go with your sticks, dressed, ready to go to the course. And uh, we'll get in either nine um, on a show day, 18 on a day off. And we can do it rather quickly at this point um, because we've just done it a lot. We play a lot of golf. So we can get that done like before noon and then head back to the hotel, take a rest, maybe do an interview, maybe do a podcast, maybe take a nap, get stuff ready. Uh, go to the venue around the afternoon, four o'clock, do a sound check, get to play on the stage, plug in your guitars, see how they feel. Everything's good. Go to catering, rest a little bit, 
there's any sort of pre-show stuff to do, if you want to meet people before, I like to go out and actually walk around the venues sometimes just to meet people, call it the rock and roll parking lot. And I just go shake people's hands. Sometimes you're really surprised, like, aren't, what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, you know what? Backstage, it's just a bunch of guys on their phone, you know, checking Instagram. Here, I can actually make Instagram posts with you guys and just <laughs> chill out and maybe, you know, That's can cool. make a few converted, you know, convert a few people to check out my solo stuff as well. So I do this thing called the Rock and Roll Parking Lot. I do that, go back, get dressed, get ready to play, do the rock show, which is the main event of the day. Then afterwards, wind down. Alice does a meet and greet, which usually takes a little while. By that time, we're all on the bus. Once we're all on the bus and rolling, that's when the poker cards come out. We deal out the chips. We play, we play, you know, hour, hour and a half of poker, sometimes two hours. And then we get on, go into the bunks, sleep. And guess what? It's almost 6.30, 7 o'clock to start the next day. And there you go. <laughs> so you, are you on the golf course for every, for every show that you can? Yeah, pretty much every show we can. We've, we, yeah, you know, you when guys, we talk about bucket list places, we've, you know, it's almost now to the point where, like, what are the bucket list golf courses, you know? <laughs> right. <happen>. ask that. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't played Augusta. So for all of you, don't get, you know, that are getting ready to write hate mail. Don't worry. Yeah. We have not played Augusta yet. Um, but we played pretty much every really cool golf course and especially so many country clubs that pattern themselves. You know, there's a couple country clubs that, that had so much money that in a way they've patterned the, the uh, course after Pebble beach, for instance. So you, sure. why would you're playing it? <laughs> basically, you know, it's, it's like real life week golf. <laughs> now who's the better golfer, you or Alice? Oh God, Alice by far. There's not even it's a chance. Right There's not even, not even a chance. Yeah. I mean, he taught me how to play golf. So, um, but things have been getting to, you know, they've been clicking and it takes a while for things to sort of just become second nature, just like with guitar. I mean, there's just going to be those years and years of like, I'm a little bit stumbly and, um, with golf, it's, I think it might always be that way for me, but, but just recently I've started to feel real comfortable faster, you know, for some Wait, reason. Play in Sweden? I do. Yeah, I do. I haven't this year because it's just been a weird year. I've been doing so much work in the, uh, in the, in this room, actually so much live streaming, podcasting and, uh, recording and working on this guitar system, uh, this thing called the system 12 where I'm teaching a whole new method of, of how to learn guitar. So I've been really immersed in that, but uh, Sweden is a big golf culture. They have, a, they have a lot of golf and uh, yeah, I'm looking to get a few more rounds in because again, it does at this time of year, it stays pretty light, pretty late. So that's good. nice. It li literally, you guys played uh, a golf course right down the street from my house. I was doing a wedding the very next day and they're like, when you guys played uh, the Portland, uh, not Portland, Westbrook, Maine, uh, one of the last year you guys were playing. Okay, and what you was did that? the golf course, uh, Spring Meadows or something like that. I forget yeah, what the Spring name Me was. That sounds very familiar. There's yeah, you guys meadows, were there. There's a lot, there's a lot I, of I shot the wedding and they were like, oh, yeah, Alice Cooper was just here like yesterday. And I was like, oh, dang. <laughs> Fallen Oaks, Spring Meadows. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot spring of that Spring Creek. Everywhere. Yeah. Something, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's, they, trust me, country clubs are, are the best. Yeah, yeah, totally. Let's shift over to your podcast. So sure. uh, we started ours just because we couldn't physically do shows. So we had a lot of stories. We have a lot of history with our venue and different artists we've worked for and stuff like that. So I'm assuming maybe that was sort of similar to your idea. Of yeah, I, I definitely kicked it up. Yeah, I definitely kicked my podcast up to a to a another level once all this stuff kind of shut down. I started it last year uh, when I was going out on tour and um, I just felt like, you know what, for years I've been trying to find this sort of niche of, I want to get into people's heads of, of the musicians I've sort of talked to, you know, on tour buses. Like we have these big, deep conversations on the tour bus, but no one's ever recording anything. And especially during those poker games or, you right. know, or if we're just in the back lounge. And there's so many cool things, inspiring things that get said, but they're never, there's never a recorder on at that point. So I felt, could we sort of establish that type of environment where a musician is just sort of, 
you know, talking with another musician, but doing it in an interview style, because at the same time, I do want to find out about how this other person got to where they are at this point, what inspired them. And I felt that as a musician myself, I could maybe have a, some relatability that, that maybe other journalists didn't have because I played a lot of the same venues. You know, we did interviews in a lot of, a lot of these venues that we had. So I just started doing them and um, then more and more, uh, first it started off with some friends you know, and then I, my band members, and then it kind of grew and grew. And then I started taking some risks and asking some of my guitar heroes if they would be interested or just people that were really influential to my own musical upbringing. And they started saying yes. And so now when you have a guy like Steve Stevens, who I grew up listening to, uh, you know, and, and patterned a lot of my playing off of Steve Stevens, when he's coming on my podcast, I'm like, okay, now it's getting real because now it's like these are credible names. And then, then of course, there's some peers that, that you know, um, Phil X, the guitarist from uh, Bon Jovi, he's just like one of those guys. He's a great guy. We're the same age. And then when we start talking, we realize, man, we have a lot in common, but we've never really bonded up until now. So this podcast has been a really good uh, way of me bonding kind of with my guitar heroes and my guitar uh, sort of... Uh, Brethren, if you want yeah. to say. Drummers are always cool with each other. They always like each other. But guitar players, there's always been this sort of mystique about, yeah, shit talking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're talking behind each other's backs and stuff. But, but you know what? If, if this podcast has proven anything, it's proven that, at least for me, there is a lot of, I hate saying this word because I never say it right, camaraderie. Sure. Did I say it right? Wow. Yeah. I never say it right because I'm, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> It's like saying Minneapolis. Yeah. You know, you always want to mess it up at some point. But there is this this sort of a kinship among us guitar players that I'm realizing is very cool. And uh, a lot of these guys have similar backgrounds. You know, a lot of them, Joel Hoekstra, for instance, who's played with Cher and he's played with White Snake for years and, and done so many uh, bigger bands. He's started out like me as a guitar teacher, you know, started out as sort of teaching people and then now he's in a really great position and just recently i've had rick nielsen on the show yeah, on the awesome. podcast you know having davy johnstone from the uh elton john band the original guitar player who's been with elton all these years davy was a very inspiring guy to have on and um the, the list just keeps on going so hopefully knock on wood that uh, we can continue to have uh, amazing guests and amazing conversations. I know, um, I'm not sure when this exact podcast is airing for us, but uh, I know that we just uh, confirmed Orianthi is going to be coming on, oh, who cool. I played with before and Alice Cooper. Yeah. And she's, uh, if you don't know who Orianthi is, she's an amazing guitar player from Australia who um, also played with Michael Jackson for, for yeah. a short time. And, um, you know, just, Finding out this, these interesting stories and, and what inspires these people, that's, that's been pretty much the main um, goal and sort of reward out of this whole podcast. And the podcast is called In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy, right? That is it. In the Trenches cool, with excellent. Ryan Roxy. And, and uh, you can find it at ryanroxy.com or just go on to YouTube because I do have an official Ryan Roxy official YouTube channel. Plus, if you just want to, if you only like podcasts on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or it's, it's on all the platforms. So hopefully. And you do it live, right? On Tuesdays, I do a live stream. Sometimes we have taped episodes where I'll, I'll put them out um, later. But for the most part, and since this uh, sort of the shutdown and the pandemic stuff, I've been doing a live stream. And it's really interesting to see that this, because there's a live chat, we can go on simultaneously with Facebook Live and YouTube Live, and there's chats in both uh, platforms. And it's amazing to see this sort of community building. Sometimes they're talking about something completely different in the chat than when I'm interviewing one of my guests, because out of the corner of my eye, like, what are you guys talking about that for? It's, it's you know, I'm talking with Rick Niels from yeah. about, yeah. So, but, but it's great to see this, 
this sort of community building week by week. And hopefully, um, if you're listening right now, you can come and check it out because uh, it's a very, it's a very cool place to be, and you're you're totally invited. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, definitely, absolutely, we'll be uh, checking in and, uh, and joining in. <laughs> hopefully, staying on topic with you. <laughs> the uh, the so your position, you come in at this in the band. You are in this sort of. I I just I just want to say you know, for me, very, very inspirational position where, A, you have such a history yourself. You have a nice history of musical diversity and stuff like that. But uh-huh. the band you're in also has very specific time periods of very classic oh and yeah. influential history with different yeah. guitar players, different musicians all together. How do you adapt to all that? That's the challenge, but that's, that's also one of the biggest thrills about being in the band is because we're not just one Alice Cooper band, whether even, whether it's the albums that I got to actually write with Alice uh, and we performed the eyes of Alice Cooper and dirty diamonds. That was a, a real cool era where the band and Alice were all writing together and putting out these sort of um, a little bit more lo-fi garage uh, production, but in a cool way, kind of gritty, sleazy rock and roll. So that was a, that was an era. And, I talk about these eras of Alice Cooper. There's so many different lineups and great eras of Alice Cooper that he's had over the years that we get to uh, play those songs. We get to play other people's amazing riffs and try to make them our own, but still play them in the spirit of what the original song was. So it's a, like I said, it's a challenge, but it's such a reward when um, – a fan can come up and say, man, I can't believe you played that song off of uh, you know, raise your fist and yell with the same sort of intensity that, 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 that album would have had, but you even made it your own as well and gave it a sort of a, a new twist with this lineup. So I'm, I'm really proud of the fact to be part of this lineup with Alice because Alice does give us a lot of accolades, but I think having the three guitar players allows us to do a bunch of these different eras and the three guitars players, myself, Tommy Hendrickson, and of course, Anita Strauss. And with the three of us, we get those. And then you have Glenn Sobel and Chuck Gehrig that, that completely provide such a strong foundation. And then you have Alice Cooper as, you know, he's the ringleader. It's the, it's, it's the thing. It's like, we know that 98% of the time, everybody's looking at Alice, but it's our job for that other 2% or maybe 0.01% to get to be entertaining. So when people do uh, check out the entire band, they see this really energized. There you go. There you go. They yeah. see this energized sort of in your face sort of thing. And I think Nita's going to smash guitar on Hemp's head right about now. <laughs> <laughs> Are you allowed Perfect. to... Are you allowed to bring your tone to the guitar or are you trying to match the sort of date of the tone? I think my tone is my tone regardless. I mean, I'm a basically, if you give me a Gibson Les Paul and I plug it through a Marshall JCM 800 or something that's the equivalent of that, I don't care if it's a modeling amp or or an amp that, that, says they're they sound like those amps. The the recipe is always Gibson through a Marshall. And you know, yeah. like I said, I play Stratocasters. I play my own brand called uh, GMP. Years ago, I had a, a Ryan Roxy model of that. Um, oh, cool. And who knows? I don't close the door on on brands because a lot of people make a lot of good equipment and stuff. Yeah. But if you're going to the source, it's a Gibson through a Marshall, and that's the recipe of rock. That's the way I sound. All those older records, the ones that I really, especially the original band, they have that sound. And I can manipulate a sound close enough to it. Whereas when we do the 80s stuff, Nita's tone is perfect for that, you know, and she, and she can adapt. And obviously when we play a certain era of Alice Cooper song, we know without even discussing it, we know who's going to be playing the solos on the song. And, and of course, some of us will, will back it up with a harmony or some of us will take the foundation uh, root chords, but it, it works out really well having the three guitar player lineup, I think. Very lucky cool. too. So when it comes to like photography and stuff like that, so from an artist's perspective, you probably see tons of Instagram tags. You, you probably have your own, I'm assuming maybe your own photographer or whatever. When you yes. see all these, you're probably going to see a wide variety of 
not so good and to great possibly. But what do you like for if, if you know for, for photography in regards for concert photography? What do you look for? What what is you know what catches your eye? <laughs> I always look. I always like it when I, I look younger <laughs> in the photo, <laughs> and you know I know that. I know that like you said I do have a photographer that happens to produce the podcast as well. So oh, awesome. Vic Chalfont gets us a lot of, uh, yeah, he helps out so much and he takes some great live shots as well. And, I, and I'm looking at, I'm assuming that the shots that I'm looking at behind hemp are, are your shots. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and they oh, have, they yeah. <laughs> look you. awesome. No, it doesn't matter, but see, but so there, there you go. Yeah. That, that's a perfect example. Like yeah. the, the, something that's intense. I like an intense vibe to a photo. And if you can capture, like, it, sometimes, like, it's really hard, I understand, for a photographer to not catch a guitarist looking like an idiot with guitar face. We all know about guitar face. You guys know yes. about guitar face. I mean, it's, go to a John Mayer concert, and I'm sure you can probably get one <laughs> shot out of a thousand of him not making a guitar face. Slash is another one. Slash makes a really pretty horrendous guitar face when he's sewing. I do some. I, I definitely do. And so what I always look for is, yeah, if you, do, <laughs> if you can try not to post shots with a guitar player having guitar face, they're much happier because we really look uh, damaged. I think that's yeah. a, a good word to put. I'm trying to look for the right term that won't get me canceled at this point in this society. <laughs> but you just, you look, you look like you have a lot of wear on your soul in a lot of these games. Because yes, you're intense. It's, it's, it's a moment of true and, you know, you're really into it. But your face is just, it's, it's, it's not the way that you think you're looking like at that moment. Oh, right. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. basically, a dream photo for me would be when a, a photographer captures a moment of me playing a, a really cool, intense solo, but it's the way that I feel I'm looking when I'm playing it. Because nine times out of ten, I'm cross-eyed or I'm not thinking about my facial expressions. I'm just, you know, my mouth is like, you know, one chin is over on the bite by my ear. And it, you don't have any facial uh, control, I think, when you're yeah. really into a, a good solo. But every once in a while, they'll capture that moment where you go, yeah, I look as cool as the guitar solo sounds. <laughs> right. Yeah. That yeah. Makes we sense. catch just a split second. So it's, yeah. it's timing. And we delete a lot of those guitar faces. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that. We appreciate it. Because we're talking some of that, too. Whole, I wouldn't do that to anybody. <laughs> yeah. well, I think if we had a guitar, if there was a guitar players union, that would be like one of the things where we'd have to <laughs> banish all guitar face. But then, or, or maybe just make a special hall of fame. Because, I mean, maybe there should be, uh, you know, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it, maybe should, there should be a wing dedicated to just really bad guitar <laughs> face photos. And I, because then I, at least I'd know I'd make it into the Hall of Fame. It's funny, the John Mayer thing. I think if you look, at, Facebook has like the slug thing with John Mayer because of all of the facial expressions of him holding yeah, a slug. A, slu a of slug's a, a good term. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. There's that's a funny fair. gif on that one. But yeah, yeah, totally. It's, you know, it's the same thing for singers too. And this is one of the things that we're challenged with is obviously we have the lighting issue. We have the placement of where we're allowed to shoot from. Luckily with Alice, when you guys came through, we were allowed to have four songs down in the pit, which is gives us a nice close up. But also, we have the up angle, so you always get the you got to be careful of the double chin. You stuff. always get that chin with the, with yeah. it in the pit. I know, yeah. but I, I I commend you guys. Like, I don't know if it's something that's happened with technology, but. I'm seeing much, or you're able to sort of erase it with filters. I don't know if there's a, a no double neck or double chin filter that you can buy, but I've noticed that more and more photos are not uh, as, um, oh my God, thank you so much, darling. There you go. See? Persistence. <laughs> Jealous. Cheers. Persistence, folks. That's great. Love being married to a South African. She is an amazing girl from Cape Town, and uh, wow, she makes nice. a hell of a cocktail. Nice. Awesome. Yes, she does. Mm. I make them usually, but uh, she's made this one. Um, the thing is, I feel that it's, it, it's um, I, I like the, the 
the, the shots that come from up there, but I understand a lot of people's worry. And, and I, at first I was like, well, why can't people shoot the whole show? But then I realized, especially with, with classic rock artists, older artists, maybe, you know, all that, that whole facade starts to come down after more songs, right? That's what everyone's so worried about. It's the, it's the you know, yeah. the infamous that image, Vince Neil, yeah. the Vince Neil law, you know, the law of Vince, where <laughs> I think they could only get two songs on the Motley tour. It was, it was like, no, you guys get the, your cool rock shots and then, you know, off with, you know, let, let, us, let us be... Uh, unhinged from there on yeah yeah definitely <laughs> i'm so used to people you know just growing up in the clubs and playing clubs for you know most of my career that you know people if they would have a camera they would probably shoot the whole show and now oh, totally. yeah with, with cell phones people are shooting the whole show anyway yep yep <laughs> talking about that. Yeah. now do you yeah, guys definitely. have a tour photographer following you guys around or um we actually have uh, an amazing photographer who happens to be Alice's assistant. Assistant. So he has Kyler Clark. He's a, goes by the name uh, Serial Kyler yep. on uh, on Instagram. He well, think of the access. He's Alice's assistant, so he gets and he's the one that basically uh, cuts off Alice's head at night. He was uh, our big baby on the 2019 tour. I don't know if you remember seeing the baby come out of the castle. Yep. See, yep. that's the thing being in the Alice Cooper band. You can, you can be a guitarist or you can be a guitar road, you know, tech. I can't say roadie. And then that's one of those, that was one of those words that's canceled out in 2020. It's a guitar technician. Uh, yeah. you can, but you're also going to be in the show. You're also going to be a part. You're going to be a key. You're either going to be a henchman or you're going to be some sort of ghoul at one point. So, there's, you wear many hats in the Alice Cooper organization, but Kyler came in being a photographer and that was his passion before he ever started working with Alice. So he's really good at it. And actually the back, the back photo of my solo album, uh, Imagine Your Reality, that's one of a, that's a Kyler Clark shot. Got nice. That. Yeah, I've reached out to him on, on here as well. Work yeah. on social media all night uh, after the concerts or? Picking through photos and yeah, are you talking about him or are you talking about what he does and stuff? Because he also is in charge of taking all the VIP meet and greet photos. So right. imagine, yeah, the, like I external guess. hard drives. I think is his middle name. I think is I think he has an open account at uh, some sort of Fry's Electronics. You guys oh, all yeah. know about that. Remember, yeah. like when when you know it was like one picture or one hard drive. You could like I can hold ten photos on this yeah, hard drive. Okay, and, yeah. Now it's like you know I have basically NASA's you know technology in my pocket. Yeah, no kidding. Oh my god. Okay, so let's. Uh, anything else you want to talk about before we wrap it up? Specifically, Ryan. Well, um, I would love if you guys could. Uh, spread the word and get people out to the uh, podcast while yep. they have all these yeah. guests. Cause there's a lot of other episodes that I think people would be very entertained to hear. Yep. Um, I can't wait until um, we actually are out there again, touring in some sort of capacity. I do miss the sheds. I miss, you know, actually playing for you guys. Uh, even if it's just for those first three or four songs that you're just snapping, I, I do my best, man. I yeah, because I realize that it's like there's a lot of real estate up there on stage, and you guys can pick, you know, any one person you could pick. And obviously, Alice is, is the first choice to get that magic shot. But I always appreciate when when people come over and uh, get a few shots of me and post them up. And uh, I try to do the best at tagging because I know that uh, you guys put your work in, you know, just as much as we do. So you deserve the credit as well. And um, I guess the other thing would be if you. Anyone that's been listening to this, if they feel like uh, jumping in and starting to play guitar and uh, we're listening to my talk about this new guitar method I have called System 12, the best thing to do is just go visit me on my official website, which is uh, ryanroxy.com. Everything's very easy. It's like, you know, Twitter's at Ryan Roxy, Instagram's at Ryan Roxy, Facebook at Ryan Roxy, and the website's at is ryanroxy.com. Cool. So I have All a bunch right. of so your no, classes bunch, um, aimed at the beginner or yes, advanced? it's for people starting out at beginner to intermediate because I feel once you once you reach that intermediate level, you pretty much are on your own anyway. You pretty much yeah. have taken that guitar journey, and um, 
are, are discovering things on your own. So my job, I feel, is to get the beginner and intermediate players to keep them inspired until they until that sort of uh, it, that snowball is is sort of self rolling. Yeah. You know, it's how, it's how we snowball into you, you into a, and like whatever you want to be, whatever type of guitar player you want to be. Um, like I said, it, it doesn't have to be, not everyone that plays guitar has to do it as a paid professional musician. I say mm-hmm. some of the best and cheapest therapy you'll ever purchase is Absolutely. playing music and yeah. learning how to play guitar. And it's one of the cheapest bar tricks you can ever, you know, ever get to like win someone over you know it doesn't matter man women child it's like you you strap on an acoustic guitar you play a song that they like and all of a sudden they are your best friend and uh and it's i'm telling you it's not as hard as people make it out to be especially with the way that i've uh, uh put together this system 12 because i teach it in an unconventional way um i teach it where you're learning a song on the very first lesson and by the end of the course, it's only 12 lessons. Um, I pretty much tell you, you can play, you can learn how to play, um, have a good foundation of playing guitar. 12 lessons in 12 weeks, you'll learn 12 songs and 12 riffs. So there you go. That's great. That's really cool. Sounds, sounds great. Awesome. So check it out. Yeah, check All it right. out if you can. Excellent. All right. Appreciate you guys right. having me on, man. It's been good. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on. We're Obviously, big fans, as well as, you know, we enjoy being a part of the concert experience, but we're really big fans of your work and uh, well, next a lot time, of your coworkers as well. <laughs> all right. Well, next time we're, we're in the same sort of vicinity, we're in the same, like, you know, sort of area, then just look me up. Whether it doesn't have to be that same venue, it doesn't have to be New Hampshire, it can be anywhere around. Just, uh, you know, track me down and say, hey, we did a killer podcast and uh, I want to come to the show. Cool. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank That's you so great, much. Guys. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Tales from the Pit with Ryan Roxy. We hope you enjoyed the show. Make, make sure you check us out at talesfromthepit.net and also check out ryanroxy.com. Is that right? No. That's the one. Ryanroxy.com. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Enjoy the ride.